evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's closing keynote lecture for May Act Resist, a teacher on borders and migration. In the summer of 2019, shortly after the current administration responded to a humanitarian border crisis by declaring a state of emergency, three fluorescent pink seesaws were strategically installed across the south southern U.S. border wall. This intervention encouraged children living on opposite sides of the wall to do what comes intuitively to them, play together. The subversive act of challenging the security barriers legitimacy by focusing on community ties captivated an entire nation and sparked a debate over the role of art and activism as a means to address the societal concerns and inequalities affecting our borderlands. Ronald Rael is a design activist author and thought leader within the topics of additive manufacturing, border wall studies, and urban architecture. His work prompts us to analyze how the simple act of drawing a line on a map can transform the way we experience the world. He is the author of Border Wall as Architecture, a re-examination of what the 650 miles of physical barrier that divides the United States of America from the United Mexican States is and could be. His Oakland-based creative practice, Rael San Fratello, along with architect Virginia San Fratello, is grounded in the pursuit of applied architectural research. Established within the context of the World Trade Center's attacks, their studio is a vehicle to imagine alternative outcomes for architectural practice in a post-9-11 world. These epical events, along with ancestral ties to the Southwest, became the underpinnings for exploring ideas of political, cultural, and material dualities in the borderlands and design at large. In January of 2021, their upcoming show at SF MoMA, Drawing the Line, Rael San Fratello at the US-Mexican border, is an exhibition that will cover Rael San Fratello Studios' years-long project that explores the idea of a post-wall world. Ron holds the Eva Lee Memorial Chair in Architecture and a joint appointment in the Department of Architecture in the College of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley and the Department of Art Practice at the same institution. I first heard of Ron speak at Berkeley event in support of their Chicano Architectural Student Association many moons ago, but his influence was monumental. As a Mexican transporter citizen, I was instantly captivated by how he described the history of an ongoing border making process through a constellation of architectural typologies, which continued to be instrumentalized by the nation building project to assert sovereignty through force. We are thrilled for him to bookend our event series and what's been an invigorating series of conversations. So please help me welcome warmly Ronald Rao. Thank you, thank you, Jose. Thank you, everyone. I'm very honored to uh, present tonight's keynote uh, for this really important initiative put on by CCA. Um, <clears throat> as as Jose mentioned, I'm I'm part of a, a number of endeavors, and I'm going to talk tonight about the work of those particular endeavors that range from activism to design to additive manufacturing entrepreneurism but contextualizing it that it all comes from the same place which is an expanded notion of what i think are the borderlands in the united states um so i, I think it's important to contextualize this work from where i am coming from right at this moment uh which is the landscape of my own ancestors, which include the Diné, the Pueblo, the Hikari Apache, the Kiowa, the Ute in the San Luis Valley in the Southern Colorado. Um, it is the largest Alpine Valley in the world. And in many ways, I see this landscape as part of a expanded borderlands. Um, it's bordered by 14,000 and 13,000 foot mountains. It straddles the border between the states of Colorado and New Mexico. And up until 1848, it was the northernmost frontier of uh, Mexico. Now, this is also the headwaters of the Rio Grande River, which today, of course, define the border between the United States and Mexico. 
but this watershed has its own complex history of being a border, not only dividing this valley in half, um, but it's also the northernmost route of migration of the Spanish and, and Mexicans into what is today the United States. And the memory and history of that of, of these endeavors continues and perpetuates today. And so in addition to the work that I'm gonna talk about later, I want to contextualize this work in terms of the projects that I do here, which involve the restoration of up to 11 adobe houses, historic houses, including the Ute Indian Agency, which was established in 1855 in the territory of Colorado. Um, and my own house, uh, which is an adobe house, which from where I continue today to teach indigenous and traditional uh, building technologies, um, as well as traditional indigenous foodways. Um, and I do that largely as a participant in the Rural Environments Field School, which I host on this property, which my family has lived for eight generations. Um, and you can learn more about it by going to ruralenvironments.org. It's, it's uh, sponsored by the University of Colorado Boulder and students come to this property and they learn about the intersection between contemporary art and the rural environment here. Um, well, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, there's a font window in the lower right corner I don't know if you can see that or. I don't see a font window. What does it look like? Uh, let me stop this for a second. Ah, I see that. Okay, thank you for that. Is that better? Great, thanks, Larry. Um, until 1845, this landscape, as I mentioned, was Mexico, but at that point, Texas ceded the Union, and this valley was divided in half, and this is all that remained of Mexico in the United States. Um, but what's interesting to me about this also is that, just like the contemporary border today, there was a militarization of the historic border. And the borderlands are interesting to me because these are landscapes where uh, people of different beliefs and cultures who speak different languages, who dif eat different foods, rub up against each other in some really remarkable ways, um, sometimes ridiculous ways, sometimes violent ways. But the establishment of these forts, mainly in Colorado, are interesting because architecturally they look like this. This is a U.S. fort constructed in Colorado uh, along the, the historic border that is made uh, in ways that are similar to those buildings that were built a thousand years ago, just across that border. This is Taos Pueblo and Taos uh, uh, Pueblo, New Mexico, constructed of only mud and, and logs. Um, 1,000 years old, it is the oldest continuously occupied building in, in North America uh, and continues to thrive today. But it's these moments these frictions emerge that speak to this landscape and, and border landscapes as hybrid landscapes where, again, these, these frictions between people and beliefs and ideologies rub up against each other. And the architectural outcome of that is very interesting, but it also the memory of these frictions uh, remain for a very long time. Even today, if we fast forward to uh, from 1848 to 1930, uh, six, for example, when uh, the governor of Colorado uh, declared martial law and sent National Guard troops to the Colorado New Mexico border to prevent indigenous and people of Mexican descent from entering the state of Colorado. So these National Guard troops were sent to the border and to train stops, and they would they would check people by what they thought they looked like and could make decisions whether they could come into Colorado or not. This martial law only lasted a few days, a very difficult endeavor for sure, because I have neighbors here who go to bed in New Mexico and go to the bathroom in Colorado because their house crosses that borderline. Even today, that memory lingers, and we could think about within just within the year or so when the the leader of the current regime said that he was actively building walls in Colorado. And I'm not sure where he was thinking that was taking place, but perhaps this is uh, the kind of map that he was imagining uh, would, would constitute a place for border walls. 
Now I talked about the hybridity of this landscape and how it's evidence in the architecture. This is San Lorenzo in, in Picuris Pueblo in New Mexico, a building built in the 1700s, entirely made of non-industrial materials, mud from the site, uh, logs from the hills behind, an earthen roof, a ladder to access that roof so you can maintain that mud roof. Again, fast forward to the 30s, we see how the introduction of the railroad and the sawmill, different technologies, different cultures transform the building. Now it has a pitched roof, uh, tin uh, cladding the, the pitched roof, lime plaster on the front facade, uh, build lumber is used to construct that roof. Um, and if we look at that building today, it is trapped in a historical moment when it refers to the building formally as it did in the 1700s. The, the ladder no longer accesses the dirt roof, but is a symbolic just to gesture to uh, the past when in fact the roof is made out of uh, tar. It's a flat built up roof. Uh, the, the facade is in concrete and the facade entrance is in maybe the moment of, of like Home Depot materials, uh, some four by fours painted white with some uh, galvanized trim. Um, and so these kind of ideas of hybridity and transformation are what inspire me to think about how design can emerge from the borderlands. The lowrider, for example, is the evisceration of the interior of these churches, which are highly ornate when the villagers in the 40s and 50s would leave to work in the mines and move to the cities to find jobs and taking these churches with them on the wheels of low, low riders. This one in particular is famous because it comes from Chimayo, New Mexico, but it uh, is currently housed in the Smithsonian in Washington, DC today. But other kind of vehicles move across the landscape. As building codes were established that no longer allowed traditional builders to build their own houses because of the demands for certain regulations like the sizing of, of concrete uh, foundations to move below the frost line, which is about six feet and to reach the thickness of an adobe wall, which can be two feet thick, making it extremely expensive to construct. At the same time, wealthy people would build enormous McMansions of adobe, prompting the largest adobe factory in the world to be established in New Mexico that drives across the landscape, consuming earth, and in its wake, leaving up to 25,000 adobes produced each day. These kinds of examples can be found in many places. I, in the borderlands, I point to again to uh, Casa Grande in Arizona, built by the Hohokam in the 1400s, when it was quote unquote discovered, it was attempted to be preserved by bringing in redwood from California and uh, tin to make a protective enclosure, a kind of cocoon of modernity around this historic structure. And in 1926, a international competition was held to design a canopy structure that would protect this building. The winner of that uh, competition was Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., the son of Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Golden Gate State Park and Central Park in New York City. His idea was that the structure would be pulled far enough back from the, from the historic structure that it would highlight the earthen building. Uh, but what I think happened was something quite remarkable, that a new kind of borderlands uh, architecture was created an architecture that is simultaneously contemporary and historic that brings together different material traditions and different craft traditions, different cultural traditions, uh, synthesizing to make this unique borderlands architectural expression. And I have uh, explored this idea in my own practice, uh, perhaps the first Adobe house built in Marfa, Texas for 100 years. This was built for a couple who was displaced by Hurricane Katrina, and they wanted to build their own house and relocate to Marfa, Texas. So we designed a very simple house uh, that was made entirely of adobe, plastered with mud on the outside and inside. So the entire section of this wall is mud, but concrete weaving into the wall for structural reasons to, to maintain this very long wall of mud and to keep it stable. Um, but I'm also fascinated by thinking about the future archaeology of the projects we do. And 
what kind of evidence one will find in thinking about the cultural ideals that go into the building. So for example, the bottom of the wall, which is adobe brick made in New Mexico, is a bit more expensive, but more durable, stronger, can hold more load. Um, but above the lintel, we used bricks manufactured in Ojinaga, Mexico. They were lighter, they were uh, less strong, but also much less expensive and, and more locally available. And so in the future, even geology of this house, you will be able to locate this house as a house of the borderlands. The interior of the house is is it's really a mud box that holds a box inside and its nickname is the box box house. The interior holds the heating system, the plumbing, the electrical, and the entire exterior walls are this more uh, traditional walls that hold the modern interiors uh, and surround them and define them. The building really does only has a couple of windows but opens up entirely to this uh, enclosed courtyard in the center. So people perceive this house as not being connected to the outside when in fact when you go in you actually feel like you've entered into the outside environment. While that house allowed us to explore these ideas of the borderlands through material, through geology, through archaeology, uh, we are asked to collaborate with two artists, Elmgreen and Dragset from Berlin, on a project that they first dubbed Prada Nevada, but it was asked to be relocated to uh, Marfa, and we were asked to design the structure on, on their behalf. And it was a project that for us allowed us to think about the borderlands in a very different way, in a way that demonstrated uh, that architecture could communicate political ideas. Um, I think Prada Marfa for me is a, is a project that even crosses the border between art and architecture for a number of reasons. But if you're unfamiliar with Prada, they are a clothier from Milan that sells shoes and bags upwards of $1,000 uh, a pair. And we are constructing this building in a landscape where the traditional shoe used for thousands of years was made of yucca, a, a fibrous plant that grows ubiquitously in this landscape. But it's also a landscape where people walk for hundreds of miles on a destination north until their shoes actually wear out and they have to stuff yucca leaves in their shoes to continue this journey. The facade of the building and the interiors was inspired by a photograph by the photographer Andreas Gertzky called Prada. And it is a photograph of a Prada store in Milan without any merchandise in it. Um, this is what Prada Marfa looked like in 2004 when it was completed. It holds the 2004 line of shoes and bags by Prada. It was not sponsored by Prada, but it's a story that it's a, it's a project that tells the story of the juxtapositions between wealth and poverty, between the United States and Mexico, uh, between Mexican and Anglo, uh, these kinds of, again, uh, forming juxtapositions that are, were emerging in this landscape at this time, that were being talked about. These tensions were emerging because so many people were moving to Marfa, and this project kind of epitomized these kinds of conflations. Um, and again, in the archaeology of the house, we are thinking of, of how this house would be read as a ruin. And so when forts were constructed after the Mexican-American War along the contemporary border, and you can find these forts like in Marfa, Fort D.A. Russell, for example, you will find that while they trusted the adobe brick made out of mud, for some reason they didn't trust the mortar made out of mud. And so many of these forts are constructed with mud brick uh, set in a cementitious mortar. And so we used that material system as well to reference those historic forts in which also the, the minimalist artist uh, Donald Judd used uh, in the construction of many of the walls in his compound that took over military forts. And so what's interesting about these walls also is that in their degradation over time, this particular combination of materials has an interesting effect. Setting an earthen block in an impervious cementitious mortar 
causes the mud brick to erode much faster. And what's happening in many cases is that we're left with this diaphanous screen of simply the mortar itself. Another phenomenon that came out of Prada Marfa was that it demonstrated to me that architecture can be a cultural object. And a cultural object in this case that emerges from Instagram. It was said that Prada Marfa was one of the first Instagrammable works of art or architecture, primarily fueled by uh, Beyonce jumping in front of the building like this and posting it to her Instagram account. And now many people, when they visit Prada Marfa, they do this same jump. Um, but what I mean by a cultural object is that it enters the public consciousness in a number of ways. Um, for example, when last year the Simpson family left for Springfield on a cross-country trip and stopped in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert at Prada Marfa uh, because Homer needed to take a leak behind the building. While we were working on Prada Marfa, we were seeing the consequences of 9-11 several years later, which was that the border itself was uh, becoming the scapegoat for terrorism. And so a narrative was forming about, about terrorism that prompted the Secure Fence Act of 2006, which mandated the construction of 800 miles of wall along the US-Mexico border. Over 700 of those miles have been constructed so far. So we were witnessing uh, truckloads of steel as if skyscrapers were about to be constructed in the desert for the construction of this wall at a cost of $4 million per mile on average. And since then, $3.4 billion have been spent constructing this wall and $49 billion are needed to finish and maintain the border wall over the next 25 years that were uh, mandated by the Secure Fence Act of, 20, uh, of 2006. Now this is not the wall that has been uh, called for by the current regime, which is a wall that replaces much of that existing wall at a cost of $70 billion. So there is sort of an, a national ignorance about what is happening at the border because the leader of the regime ran on a platform saying he will in fact construct a wall as if no wall existed when two thirds of the border between the United States and Mexico had already been walled off. And while very little of those campaign promises by the regime leader have been put to task, only about five miles or so have actually been constructed of new walls, I'd like to just put this $49 billion into context, into an architectural context. In other words, what can $49 billion uh, buy instead of a border wall? It could buy 300 Seattle public libraries or 204 Disney concert halls or 500 miles of the High Line. So remember there are uh, 700, over 790 miles now of border wall constructed just uh, approximately. And to think of what kind of cultural investment could have or could occur at the contemporary border today. The witnessing of this border wall construction prompted me to ask several questions about this construction. Um, and one of them was, is this wall architecture? Um, and what is an architecture, an architect's role in what is the largest construction project of the 21st century in the United States? Now, to define it as architecture is difficult, but certainly it is a design structure. And one way that it is designed is that um, in its initiation, it was designed at a place called Fence Lab. Um, and Fence Lab was a collaboration between Los Alamos National Laboratories and Texas A&M University. And one way that they tested the design of these structures was to load a vehicle with, I think, 40,000 pounds and ram it into this wall at 50 miles an hour to demonstrate the wall's uh, impermeability. But of course, uh, at, and, and at a tremendous cost. But of course, with all research projects, uh, there are successes and failures, but there are also counterintelligent research projects that were taking place in Mexico. For example, the development of portable drawbridges 
that were sometimes attached to vehicles that could drive up to the wall and fold the bridge over so vehicles could just drive across the walls. Sometimes to very ambitious extents, for example, this one of the most expensive walls in California called the floating fence, and this vehicle attempted just to drive over it but got high centered um, and the drivers ran away. So as I mentioned, there were there are very ridiculous ways that um, things come together at the wall at the wall and at the border, and there are very violent ways. And one of those violent ways to recognize is that since 1994, uh, and in fact, it's now more than 6,000 people have died trying to cross this border because the wall has pushed people to further extremes in the desert. Um, and those who die chiefly die of dehydration in the desert because it moves them to these uh, extremes where in fact the wall doesn't exist because the landscape itself is seen as a kind of natural barrier of travel to the United States. So it's very difficult to build a wall there, but it's also um, uh, not seen as, as needed in a way by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, in addition, over 30 laws were waived for the construction of the wall. And so environmental protection laws, Native American heritage laws, uh, wilderness laws are all uh, trumped by the Secure Fence Act of 2006, meaning it is one of the highest laws in the land and there is no stopping the construction of this wall. And that's why you see in the news, for example, uh, just, just a couple of weeks ago, in a wilderness environment, which are our most protected landscapes, we see the blowing up of mountainsides for the construction of these walls. If we zoom in a little bit closer, we see that the wall in fact is not constructed on the US-Mexico border, but always in the United States because it's, an, it's a United States construction project. And here we're zooming in to the University of Texas at Brownsville, where initially the wall was planned to divide the campus in half. And the proposition was that students would have to go uh, and check uh, and, and show their passports as they moved from class to class moving across that wall. And it was ultimately decided that the wall would be built uh, a little bit further south, blocking out Fort Brown Memorial Golf Course, which was the only place historically that Mexican Americans could play golf in Brownsville, which has now gone bankrupt and shut down because of the construction of the wall that, uh, that blocks it from the city. But it's built up to three miles into the United States. And there are, by my measures, about 44,000 acres that are south of the, the border wall. And if we zoom in even closer, we see that while despite the wall's uh, intention to keep people apart in a way, it has brought people together in some really remarkable ways in protest and solidarity and to celebrate binational heritage along the US-Mexico border. And this is one of my favorite photographs of these binational yoga classes that took place at Friendship Park. I'd like to think that everybody's doing the monument pose here. The monument that you see was how the border was defined prior to the construction of the wall. And so half of that monument lies in Mexico and half of that monument lies in the United States. And there are 250 some that define the border between uh, San Diego, Tijuana and El Paso uh, uh, Juarez, which is basically the land border before the river defines the, the, the border. This particular photograph, uh, is from the early 1900s, 1910, I believe. It's, it's, a, it's a National Geographic photograph showing a border patrol agent pulling an individual into the United States to be arrested. And his friends are pulling him back into Mexico to save him from the border patrol. And it epitomizes for me, uh, maybe two diametrically opposed ideas about the borderlands today. And one is that it is a landscape of horror, uh, horror, defined by xenophobia, racism, poverty, uh, the struggles of, of immigration, and also of humor. Uh, humor as a way to um, just deal with the horrors of the border itself. And, and I have found, and maybe you've seen in this presentation so far, that we see these, again, ridiculous and violent ways that are juxtaposed simultaneously 
that we can we can laugh at a jeep trying to cross over the border, uh, but we cannot laugh about the idea of 6,000 and more people dying because of the construction of the wall. And so since, I guess, 2004, uh, we begin to document the stories that were emerging from the construction of the wall, sort of creating a biography of the wall itself and thinking about the spaces that the wall was transforming and the problems associated with it, but also the resilience of the people who lived along the border. And we did this in a way um, that uh, we call recuerdos, or which means souvenirs, but it also means memories of remembering the time that we constructed a border wall and what a crazy idea that was. And so the outcomes were outcomes like an architect would do. We created models and drawings, but we did them in, uh, through the lens of these souvenirs, snow globes, uh, border wall games, uh, ant farms, postcards, maps, keychains, um, just different ways to tell this, these stories of resilience and the phenomena of what was happening. Uh, for example, a border patrol agent that buys a paleta from a vendor just a couple of feet away from him, but an act that is a federal offense may that caused by only a couple of centimeters of steel. And so food and money are exchanged through the wall. Um, and this is our souvenir to remember the time that food and conversation and ideas were shared through the border wall. And many of these souvenirs hyperbolize these stories or uh, I've always been asked to define what these are. Um, I, I think there's ideas that there are proposals for walls, but that's not really what they are because there's, they're inspired by stories, but they sometimes I think they're more like political cartoons because they are attempts to communicate a story very clearly. Um, uh, are, they, are they satire, are they irony? I don't really know what they are, but there are attempts to maybe as well cope and try to understand the phenomenon, phenomenons of thinking about the, this incredible steel infrastructure as a barrier to north-south movement, but wondering if it could facilitate east-west movement in, in both cities as a pedestrian and bicycle path. Um, when we envisioned this binational library, we envisioned the capacity for architecture to dematerialize the wall and dematerialize its meaning, transforming it from a structure of violence into nothing more than a bookshelf where ideas and information could be shared across the line. There was the idea that the wall was nothing more than political theater. And so this is an illustration of thinking about how we might invite uh, audiences to that theater to witness the horror of its construction with seating and a stage on both sides of the wall. A swing allows someone to enter and swing over to the other side before gravity deports him or her back to her own country. On one side, the wall might look like this. Um, looming large in someone's backyard as they're mowing it. And on the other side, it looks like this. The wall is literally the fourth wall of someone's house. Uh, this wall is not a structure that defines two landscapes, but in fact, it is a structure that divides one landscape. Um, it not only divides nations and cities and communities, but it also divides families. And the politics of the wall has divided children from their parents. We produced a series of drawings where the wall cuts directly through a single house. However, in these blueprints, the house is imagined to be designed by two architecture firms, one in Juarez and one in El Paso. And we see the average size of a house in El Paso, Texas on the right, and the average size of a house in Juarez, Mexico on the left. And we see the different construction methods used to construct the house. And if we zoom in closer to the detail, we see that the wall divides the bed in the bedroom. 
And so these are the kinds of stories that are told in this book, Border Wall as Architecture, which coincided with the uh, appointment of the current leader of the regime during the election in 2016. And so there was often misinterpretations that this book was demonstrating ideas and proposals for the design of walls for uh, uh, regime, the regime leader. However, the book is more inspired by the architect Hassan Fathi. If you don't know Hassan Fathi, he was an Egyptian architect, probably one of the most famous architects in the world of his time, at a time of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, he was likely much more famous than him, an architect entirely focused on earthen construction, building with mud bricks and adobes. Um, and he said that architects do not design walls, but the spaces between them. And so this work, Border Wall as Architecture, is thinking about how architects can think about the spaces that are defined by this wall and the urgency of thinking about how design can ameliorate the consequences of this wall. At the time that we began this book, Border Walls Architecture, we were finishing a book called Earth Architecture, inspired by our knowledge of Hassan Fathi and our admiration for him. And it's a book about thinking about how this 10,000 year old construction um, method could be thought of as a contemporary material. And it shows case studies since 1970 to the present at that time, which was 2008, of modern buildings constructed of earth. But in the afterword of the book, I wondered what is the future of earth and architecture? And so at the time, of course, I thought, well, maybe it's 3D printing. And I wanted to be uh, someone who researched that possible phenomenon of thinking about how the combination of technology uh, and traditional and indigenous building materials could come together to make new kinds of hybrid architecture emerging from the idea of the borderlands. And so we embarked on a project called Emerging Objects, which later became uh, an, an entirely new facet of our creative practice. Um, but the initial research was also inspired by, uh, th there was a, a publication that just came out in its anniversary, I think it was its 100th anniversary, saying the 40 things you need to know about the next 40 years. Uh, and the number one thing on that list was that sophisticated buildings would be made out of mud. And that was Smithsonian Magazine. And I thought that was really fascinating that that was a projection for the future. And I also thought that it was interesting to think about the number one thing that you need to know about the last 10,000 years is that sophisticated buildings were made out of mud and civilization has been working on that craft technology for all this time. So in many ways, earthen building technologies are our most sophisticated building technology in comparison to glass and steel and concrete, which have just emerged over the last several hundred years this is the building material that we have evolved with and, and evolved itself the longest. And so how can we begin to think about using additive manufacturing and clay together to take a 30,000 year old additive manufacturing tradition and think about it through the lens of 3D printing. And so in 2009, we began to explore different admixtures for thinking about what it meant to print with clay which took us into a realm of ceramics, of, of firing these very delicate objects so that they would last longer and contribute to this 30,000 year old legacy of ceramic, but also just thinking about how does this fit in contemporary society? Are we gonna 3D print some kind of dumb bricks that fit into the module of a brick, but could they hold plants or water? Could they have air pockets that hold insulation? Could we think about how we can combine and learn from, from traditional uh, technologies such as this passive cooling system, basically like a passive swamp cooler used in arid environments still today in India and the Middle East, in uh, uh, the Mediterranean Europe, where a large porous ceramic vessel is placed in a window and filled with water. As the water weeps through the pores of that vessel and evaporates, the warm, dry air passes over it and humidifies that air lowering the temperature within the building. So could that be conceived of as a single building module, uh, a brick, um, a cool brick, 
and we recognized the capacity for a 3D printer to make a highly porous ceramic brick, one that holds water like a sponge. And we could uh, have a second level of porosity, one that, that, that guides and allows warm, dry air to pass through it. Um, and so this is the cool, this is the cool brick um, from 2010, I think, um, uh, a brick that holds water, that uh, produces evaporative cooling effects, that the relief that you see keeps much of the building in shade, a practice that's used, especially in, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, so that we uh, prevent more passive evaporation from occurring too quickly. Um, and an interesting outcome of this was that while a common flat ceramic brick doesn't have any tensile strength with the mortar, this increases the tensile strength of the bond as the mortar weaves into the mesh of the brick itself. So it was not only the function of 3D printing with ceramic that intrigued us, but the possibilities of how we might deposit the material itself. And about five years ago, we embarked on a project called G-Code Clay to think about how we would simply deposit clay material onto a surface using a robot. And we arrived at some really interesting outcomes like this, for example, and this. And at that time, we were simply interested in the outcome of this material deposition we had ideas about how it could contribute to architecture, but I think we were just experimenting and playing with the possibilities of the plasticity of the material with gravity and thinking about how, while additive manufacturing was, was a technology to produce the ideal outcome in the translation from the computer to the physical world, we were interested in how we could introduce glitches into that process and how that process could produce novel results and we did not know this at the time, but it pushed us into a realm of ceramics that because no one had seen anything like this before. And we did not know what these were good for, but we were excited about the possibility, pushing uh, the material to its limits, thinking about texture and surface. And we kept every single specimen that we made, every single possible combination that we produced, we fired it thinking about these incredible textures and, and possibilities. Um, and simply seeing this as an act of discovery. Um, again, not knowing what these were good for, but imagining certain possibilities. For example, could we make uh, cladding systems or rain screens using 3D printed components, thinking about micro shading, uh, thinking about water repellent systems, thinking about textural possibilities for building facades. Um, but thinking about how we could take the material from the landscape and use it in added manufacturing, inspired by the ideas of taking mud to make an adobe brick to make a building, for example, in the borderlands, allowed us to think about how we would take different materials that were available in different landscapes and uh, produce new kinds of uh, assemblies and forms and materials and phenomena. So of course, all of you are familiar with the salt crystallization ponds in the South Bay, which are these enormous ponds filled with water at the beginning of the year. And over the course of the year, they dry to produce uh, tens of thousands of tons of salt using only wind and sun. And so could we take this material of the landscape and turn it into an added manufacturing material? And so we developed this 3D printable material made of salt. And because it is so inexpensive, you could buy truckloads of it and spread it over highways, for example. It, we wondered how we could aggregate it, how we could begin to think of the possibility of building facades, of assemblies, of buildings. This is a project we did in collaboration with CCA faculty, Tom Falders, um, to imagine the possibilities of what was uh, building uh, what building types could emerge from the landscape. And we did several projects in, in SALT, one inspired by the Inuit igloo, which uh, of course takes the material of that landscape to produce these projects, uh, these, these uh, habitats. And so we embarked on a project called SALT igloo because our material formulation was essentially SALT igloo. Each of our additive manufacturing 
research projects tested different capacities of 3D printing. In this case, how fast could we make an enclosure with a single 3D printer printing in salt, uh, where every salt panel is different? And this igloo is essentially kind of a lightweight salt tent held in tension by lightweight aluminum rods. This is it being constructed in our studio in Oakland. This is the interior of that structure. Um, and it opened up all sorts of possibilities, thinking about the 7 million tons of wood waste produced each year in the United States because of the construction industry, and taking wood waste from the Sierra Nevadas and thinking about how we can use that as an additive manufacturing materials, taking, uh, creating a kind of unnatural material that recognizes the memory of the material and in the layering of the added manufacturing creates a series of layers very much like wood grain over time. Always thinking about its aggregation as a building component, its assembly, and imagining the possibility to create uh, building facades, uh, walls, partitions, screens, and architecture. And so just last year, we uh, created a startup company. We co-founded a startup company called Forest. Um, the idea being that in Northern California in particular, the raging forest fires are largely caused by small diameter timber. Um, small diameter timber is not something that is harvested in the United States. Uh, companies in the United States much prefer old growth timber. However, technologies like cross laminated timber in other countries chiefly use small diameter timber. This is timber 10 inches and under. And so could we then use that small diameter timber and harvest that material to create a refined uh, dust powder for, for additive manufacturing? And I'm excited to say that this uh, endeavor is, is going quite well. Um, of course, cement is something that you see in the 3D printing used in architecture all the time. And we developed a very particular way to use very little water uh, using cement to make very complex forms um, and very large structures that have a, uh, uh, a compression strength similar to that of concrete. Um, and this particular project was one of our largest uh, 3D printed cement projects, all made out of blocks, but always thinking about and referring to the kinds of traditional um, uh, practices and knowledges that, that uh, inspire us to think about how we are looking simultaneously at the past in order to think about how we might build in the future. Um, so what are the outcomes of some of this research? Um, where, where do they find their application? And so when we were uh, working on these projects in, in all of these materials, we were visited by the California Academy of Sciences uh, back in, I don't know, I guess this was four or five years ago, because they wondered if we could 3D print in calcium carbonate. And they wanted to do a collaboration with us to use calcium carbonate to 3D print scans of coral. The reason was not to uh, use these as structures that would support coral growth because coral actually secrete calcium carbonate. They don't really grow necessarily on calcium carbonate itself. But the idea behind these structures was that they would use them at the, at the California Academy of Sciences to demonstrate how increasing acidity levels in the ocean degrade calcium carbonate, just essentially uh, destroying coral reefs. And so we produced these structures for them, for these the, these pedagogical initiatives they had at the museum. And when they visited our lab, they were pretty uh, thrown back by the ceramic structures that we had produced because uh, a, a group associated with them called Secor had been long studying how ceramic was the ideal substrate for coral larvae growth. Um, and so we worked with them for several months developing coral reef uh, coral seed pods. These are kind of little egg hatcheries for, for coral that when they spawn, the larvae could find a home in a ceramic structure that 
uh, was perfect, had the perfect kind of parameters for their habitat. They need to move between light and dark spaces. They need to lodge in places that they can grab onto. And it need to be a substrate that did not support algae growth. And this is why um, ceramic is perfect for that because it doesn't allow algae growth and which is a competitor to coral larvae growth. And so uh, in collaboration with them and a 3D printed uh, ceramics company and we printed several thousand ourselves in, in our lab at Berkeley, we produced over 4,000 of these uh, ceramic um, seed, uh, ceramic coral seed uh, units. And they're now being tested all over the world um, in Baja California and Curuçao in Australia um, with some pretty incredible results. And the idea being with, as we see the success of these, we are going to embark hopefully on a project to print over a million of these. And you might say, why print them? Well, the, the particular shapes allow for close packing. It allows for coral larvae to um, lodge in particular diameters and dimensions of, of places. Um, if these, these structures tumble in the ocean, uh, the larvae habitat is actually protected. And in some cases, divers can anchor these to the rough bottoms of the ocean. Um, so it's not only animal habitat that we've been thinking about and working on, but also human habitat. And so with the relaxation of zoning policies in the East Bay because of the housing emergency, which allowed for the construction of 1,200 square feet in one's backyard as an accessory dwelling unit without going before the planning commission or using an architect, we thought that this is the perfect opportunity to test many of our ideas about added manufacturing in that landscape to construct a, a, a small structure that demonstrated the possibility for 3D printing to be used in architecture. Um, again, building upon our techniques of G-code clay, we developed a, a, a rain screen where every single ceramic cladding unit is the same in the computer, but because of the, the glitchiness of the phenomena, it's all, each one is unique. Uh, after it's manufactured, held on a 3D printed uh, structure. The front facade of this uh, cabin of 3D printed curiosities is made out of 3D printed sawdust from the Sierra Nevadas, um, cement from our experiments in cement, um, and also um, grape skins that were used in uh, wine production in, in Sonoma. And each of them held uh, these succulents that grow very well in the Northern California climate. I, I just uh, received a picture of the cabin from a couple of days ago, and we see how the, the life is really thriving on this cabin. Uh, some of these succulents are blooming. We haven't been there for some time, and uh, the, the, the life is taking over in really wonderful and marvelous ways. Um, uh, the interior of the cabin is 3D printed with something that all of you might find common, which is a plastic which is made out of recycled corn, uh, backlit by LED lights that are controlled by the user to set various kinds of moods. Um, the idea for the interior was to reflect on the tradition of pressed tin interior panels, but in this case, every single one is different because it doesn't require a mold. And much of the furniture uh, the chairs and coffee tables, and you see some uh, wine goblets made out of Chardonnay grape skins and coffee cups made out of 3D printed coffee are in the interior of this cabin. Um, this is the cabin at night with a daylighting setting and uh, transformed into a bed and sets the mood for the evening. So while all of this work is born from the borderlands, I would argue, in its hybridity, in its bringing together of different ways of thinking and different technologies. We've been wondering about how we can create research that is in fact borderless, because on one end, we're working in additive manufacturing, and another end, we're working in, in uh, uh, border wall studies. And so how could we begin to think about bringing those two avenues of research together? Uh, and so one of the ways is to think about certain traditions 
and how we might think about them in contemporary ways. Here where I live, and two uh, about Chihuahua in Mexico, there's a word called hakal, which describes wattle and daub technology. So we wanted to think about how we can make a hakal uh, digital, a digital hakal. Um, this is an example of a hakal here, just logs and sticks propped up that's covered in mud. It's a very kind of rudimentary structure, something that is often built first, or in some cases, very impoverished conditions is constructed very quickly. And we were invited to an exhibition in France where they also had a wattle and daub um, building tradition. And so we 3D printed this structure out of this, um, uh, this bioplastic made out of corn and used and shipped it to France and then used the local clay there to, um, to daub the structure. Daub is a, is a word uh, that means mud essentially, it comes from the Egyptian word daub, which is where we get the word adobe. Um, and so when this dries, it gives it another layer of um, rigidity. And uh, this is what it looks like. Um, I'm gonna take a one minute break because I realize my battery is about to go dead and I'll let you linger on that beautiful image. Okay, I'm back. Where were we? So back to this idea of borderless research. Um, I was in Juarez in El Paso when the regime leader said there are a lot of bad hombres at the border. And he didn't say there were bad hombres at the border, which are bad men. He said there are bad hombres at the border. And I thought, well, that's interesting to think about an hombre at the border, this gradient between two worlds. In the art world, of course, the idea of an ombre is this gradient between light and dark. In the, in the hairstyle world, I think this is a bad ombre on the left and maybe there's a good ombre on the right. And so we created a series of objects called bad ombres out of 3D printed ceramic, where we begin to combine different clay bodies uh, clay bodies from what I would define as the democratic state of California and from the Republican state of Georgia, bringing them together to think about the distinctions and differences, yet the idea of this is one object and within that object held these kinds of distinctions at different scales, at the scale of the object itself and zooming in at uh, the scale of different details in the, in the structure. We thought conceptually, wouldn't it be much more interesting if we made bad hombres using clay from Mexico and clay from the United States? And that opened up a possibility of thinking about how we can bring this technology to the contemporary border. Thinking about how we can just go and dig up clay. And we worked on a project bringing together uh, geology professors from the University of Texas, El Paso, a ceramic professor from University of Texas, El Paso, uh, and about 25 clay artists from Juarez and El Paso uh, to travel, and, and students, of course, from UTEP, to find and think about the several thousand year old ceramic tradition of the borderlands in that region of the Mogollon people, and to excavate sites uh, of, of clay and to use those in the fabrication of a series of 3D printed objects. And we found this amazing range of complexions of clays from whites to reds to browns, even greens in some case. I think I have some pictures of that. And we developed a very simple app that would allow the ceramic artists to create um, objects for the 3D printer. Because and we, didn't, we weren't there to teach 3D modeling, for example, and the complexities of printing. And so this app we've now commercialized as an app called Potterware that is used all over the world for 3D printing clay. Uh, and it's something that runs in the cloud, uh, so it can run on multiple computers and just using a series of sliders. Um, 
uh, can produce some really marvelous objects. And so while we expected the 25 potters to produce one or two objects over the course of the project, they were so excited. I think they in total produced 270 uh, 3D printed ceramic vessels using clay from the two countries exhibited at the Rubin Center in El Paso, Texas. Um, and it was, a, it was a really amazing project for us, which we, you know, we, we didn't make these objects. We released the authorship to them, empowering them by thinking about clays that could be used um, uh, in a software that we allowed everyone to use that was really accessible. But part of the vision has always been to think about how we can print large scale 3D printed structures using local soil, uh, growing from the traditions that uh, were the traditions of my own childhood. And so this is the vision, right? To, to how can we 3D print with clay to make architecture? And so we're now in maybe year three or four of this project. The very first part of this project was a schematic design for a robot that I sent to a manufacturer in Florida and said, hey, do you think we could build something like this? And it was very excited to get the answer back. Yeah, let's do it. And so that design turned into this 3D printer that we co-developed at 3D Potter, which was exciting because it could produce a number of 3D printed objects simultaneously, which I guess I didn't really think about because this was the goal to 3D print one very large object. But in scaling up, there were other problems like how do you pump massive amounts of clay through a 3D printer? And so this is an example of a manual 3D printer here, but we're really testing how we can push huge amounts of clay through it. And as we, the project evolved, we got more and more precise and, and we were able to finesse the project and at a certain point gained the confidence to then return to the borderlands in a project that we called Mud Frontiers. We also call it Soquetes Fronterizos, which mud is about mobility, ubiquity, and democracy, to think about how we can use um, the, the land itself, which is ubiquitous, in a way that we're creating our own robot, which is lightweight and inexpensive, a software which is very accessible and easy to use to create large scale uh, structures. And so this is the first test of 3D printing in the borderlands using a material technology that has been used here for thousands of years. Um, and I'll just let you watch this while I take a drink of water. So we tested this by going out to a very remote environment, uh, excavating clay from that environment, making these experimental structures, also digging clay with our friends from, from Taos Pueblo to make functional pottery, uh, to explore ideas of possible structures under uh, four themes. One was about lightness, and in this case, how thin or light you could create an adobe structure, which is typically incredibly massive, but by curving or corrugating the mud itself, just like the difference between a corrugated piece of metal and a flat piece of metal, you have tremendous strength. But thinking about how that light can be uh, used in these remote environments as, as kind of beacons at night. Um, the other experiment was called Lookout, where we were simply experimenting if we could 3D print a staircase and what, what that means. And it opened up other possibilities of thinking about how in a very cold environment like it is here, for example, you could have a massive wall, but a massive wall that is not filled with material, but filled largely with air, creating an insulative barrier from the interior to exterior. Um, we also produced in our very first structure, which was the ugliest one, it took us a really long time to figure out, we made a kiln in which we uh, created a series of functional pottery in the tradition of, of Picuris uh, pottery, which is the, the home of my uh, grandfather's uh, grandmother, um, which uses micaceous clay. And micaceous clay uh, allows for this to be used as cookware because the mica helps absorb the heat shock. And so this can be used to make uh, beans, for example, and, and meats. Um, and in this experiment, we had two walls, a, a double wall system that were not touching together. And so as we chopped all this, this wood, we were worried about the stability of the structure and simply laid across a series of these juniper uh, sticks. 
the juniper doesn't rot at all. And so it holds together and binds the two interior exterior walls. But it's also an experiment of thinking about how we might 3D print furniture or begin to think about how we might program a space, a fireplace, for example, a place for gathering and community. Um, and so I'm just going to give you a walkthrough of our site, which is just right down the road from where I am right now, where we're doing these experiments. You saw there where we sift mud, mix it with straw, very traditional ways of thinking about mud, but calibrating it for the, the pump. Um, and then you see some of our sort this mound of dirt here is actually our sifted material. So it's just gravel, all the rocks that are too big to pass through the pump. Um, and then uh, you'll see this experiment, which we completed this summer, which is the tallest structure that we have produced so far, but it's also beginning to think about corbeling overhangs, which on a small 3D printer, you can go 45 degrees, but when you're using mud, which is incredibly heavy, how can you make an opening in a wall and how might you approach uh, making a dome, for example? Um, you might have seen a pile of fortune cookies on the floor there. That's an installation by the late artist Felix Gonzalez Torres, uh, who sent a thousand uh, boxes of fortune cookies around the world to be piled and curated. Um, so that there, oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, so our, ex our experiments continue to evolve and grow. In this case, you know, typically we would, we would print, let's say, 16 layers, allow it to dry. So we, we wait a couple hours and print again. But we created this fourth axis, this very inexpensive rail where we can move the printer uh, and print and move and print and move. Let me go back. And, and so therefore, we can print much faster than we were printing before and much larger as well. Uh, you can see some of our setup, our hose. This is, the, this is the robot in the middle. This very lightweight thing produces these enormous objects. Here you see it uh, printing and depositing mud. Um, that's me on the ladder. We placed, we placed the robot because it's so lightweight on a platform so we could print up higher. I'm controlling the robot with my cell phone. Um, here we're building higher. We made the doors this time with a lintel, which is embedded you know, in, in the code. And we just dropped the lintels right in thinking about construction processes. Um, this is us putting one of the last layers on this. Uh, um, and this is what we call Casa Covida, a house for cohabitation in the time of COVID. Um, the interior spaces after they're printed are, are being prepared for a place for sleeping, for example. Uh, we're experimenting with ways of framing views and opening up views to the landscape. Um, this is, I like this one in particular, the cows in the landscape, um, allowing light to come in, framing views, uh, views of the sky. Every room actually has two holes. A, a hole to the sky and a hole outward, a hole um, as a window, or in this case, a hole in the ground, which creates a space for bathing. And we're now thinking about how we furnish this, these interiors, how this becomes a, a hybrid space between exterior and interior that can function during different parts of the year. And this video footage uh, was just taken this morning. While we were working on this project two, two summers ago, um, there was these uh, never ending news about child separation at the border. And we were out here in the middle of nowhere working on these projects while our friends were in uh, different parts of the country and cities protesting child separation. And so we spent a quick weekend thinking about how we can contribute some signs for our friends to download, to use in the protest. And we wanted to build upon this particular sign because it's, it's commonly used as a sign of, 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 of protest. Um, and it has an interesting history as a, as a sign of commentary and, and satire and thinking about border issues. And it's a, it's a sign that actually comes from the borderlands in very complex ways. Of course, it was designed uh, to be used in California to warn motorists uh, on highways of people who were dropped off alongside the road and may attempt to run across 
the road, immigrants who were brought by, by uh, human traffickers. Um, but its, its background is that it was designed by an, an indigenous graphic designer, uh, a Navajo uh, veteran uh, who was working for the California Department of Transportation. He was from New Mexico originally, moved to Los Angeles, was working on this uh, sign um, and reflected on the plight of the immigrant today uh, in relationship to that of the Navajo during the long walk when they were displaced from their lands. Um, and I think it's a really brilliant piece of design activism, um, and, and especially from the idea that, that it, it's kind of smuggled into the uh, uh, into, into a government organization, the California Department of Transportation. He, he John, uh, John Hood, who designed this, saw a little girl with pigtails as, as someone that uh, drivers might empathize with the most, and he used the silhouette of the head of the civil rights leader Cesar Chavez as the head of the father in this sign. And so we wanted to build upon the genius of this sign and we made one simple move, which was to make turn the family to face each other and replace caution with reunite. And we placed this on the web for people to download it and notified our friends through social media. And our friends started downloading this, using it in, um, in protest and then we had the opportunity to bring this sign back to the highway just a year after the last sign had been removed from California highways in a way that I uh, could have never imagined as part of the Four Freedoms campaign, which is the largest public art campaign in the world. Uh, and the sign was placed along the highway on this enormous digital billboard uh, seen by several hundred thousand people to remind them of the atrocities of child separation at the border, which continue today. Uh, you can also see this sign uh, mounted to the walls of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine on 110th Street in uh, New York City. This is one of the more poignant photographs that someone sent to me uh, that really conflates the, the, the family on the sign and the family walking by the sign. And a artist in, in Los Angeles is downloading this sign and going to the sign company that produces signs for uh, Los Angeles streets and mounting them to, uh, to signposts around the city. And it was also part of the facade of the Johnson Museum of Art for an exhibition on borderland art, which made me think about how, again, how, you, how one smuggles activism or smuggles ideas that aren't typical to design and art into the institutions that show work. And so while this work wasn't shown on the interior as a piece of art, it was shown on the exterior. And I think it also blurs these borders between um, messaging uh, ideas, uh, political ideas and, and art itself. One of the recuerdos that I that was produced um, during this time was called uh, Teeter Totter Wall. And this drawing from um, 2009, I guess is when this, this initiated, it was, it was a story about how the border is a literal fulcrum between US-Mexico relations. Um, it talks about the balances and imbalances between poverty and wealth, um, between uh, trade balances and, and labor balances between the United States and Mexico. And so we produced uh, this drawing and this model that spoke to these kind of relationships. And over the course of the next several years, that particular project resonated with many people. And we were invited to think about how we might uh, enable this project at the border. And we worked with art organizations in several cities um, and asking for permission of those cities, which we were always approved, but never approved by the Department of Homeland Security and Border Patrol. Um, and so we thought that we should at least allow the teeter-totter to exist in the world as an object, 
but as an object that's designed for a very particular place. Um, and so we designed it thinking about the considerations of how one might smuggle design to the border and what were the uh, constraints that we had to think about, the constraints of the space between the, each steel piece of the wall, how we would install it in a wall if it actually happened. What are the pieces and parts like the handles and the seats that would have to be installed on one side? What is the, what is the actual fulcrum? What are the measurements of, of the wall? And so we, we uh, collaborated with an arts organization. Uh, well, I would say they're, I would say they're activists actually made up of artists and philosophers and poets and, and architects in Juarez uh, called Colectivo Chupeque and uh, a steel shop there as well who were friends uh, to build the teeter-totters. And in our collaborations, we thought about you know, what, what the details of this would be, how we would smuggle this into the border. Uh, this is the literal fulcrum that simply sits and locks onto the steel L bracket that holds all of these steel posts together. Um, and you can see there the monument as well. So uh, again, remember that that monument is half of it sits in Mexico and half of it sits in the United States. So there are actually several feet in that case. So if you're standing against that wall, you're actually standing on the United, United States territory. Um, the, you know, it was fun thinking about these details, the banana seats that we used. In some cases we put on handles and horns. Um, but pink was decided as the color for this project because in Juarez, the color pink is used specifically to remember the women who were killed during the time of violence, the excessive uh, violence caused by, by drug cartels. Um, and so it was decided that that was most appropriate because while we were employing play as a form of activism, we had to also remember that this was a site of violence. And so uh, as the um, tensions of, of the discussions of child separation at the border and, and continued construction of the wall and the conversation in national media continued and continued. There was just one day where it felt like the entire nation held this pressure and we decided that we would wake up and go to the border, invite some friends um, and communities and um, make this project real because the teeter-totters had been sitting in this metal shop for six months. And this is how that went down. I'll say that I was scared to death and I was worried. I was on the Mexican side, Virginia was on the US side. I was scared mostly for the people on the US side. What, what would happen? We had measured how long it would take for border patrol to arrive to the wall if we simply walked to the wall on the US side and if we walk to the wall on the Mexican side, if we walk to the wall carrying an object or not carrying an object. And we, we thought we had around eight minutes or so to allow this event to occur. Um, and certainly uh, that was the, the case. Border Patrol did show up and they asked what we were doing. And, we, and uh, this was an event that was mostly attended by women and children. And woman on the US side said, well, we're just having an event with the kids. And US Border Patrol uh, stood back and they parked and they watched. Um, we asked if they would like to participate and they said they didn't think it would be very professional of them. Uh, later, the, the Mexican National Guard arrived and they asked what we were doing. Uh, and if everybody was a Mexican citizen and the, the mother said, we're having an event with the kids, you know, just get out of here. Um, and so they stood there, they stood back and they took some photos and smiled and everyone was enjoying this. And I realized that what had happened was this idea that we were creating space, but the space was not created by the teeter-totters themselves. There was a kind of sanctuary space that was formed by the mothers and the children who had empowered that space that day. And it, it was it was pretty profound and the the event lasted for 40 minutes it stopped not because anyone told us to stop but because like children do in every park they got tired of playing on the teeter totters and if the, there there was an outcome of this project that i think in upon reflection 
is really profound for me, which is that we did not know the to what extent this project would be known. It was a very small event. Um, we did not invite any press. Um, uh, uh, some news media from Juarez heard about it uh, through rumors and, and they wanted to come along and we allowed them to come along. And, and that opened up the project to being known around the world. And I think what was important to us in its dissemination was that we're, we were able to tell another story about the border. A story that the border is not a no man's land where bad men are doing bad things, but that in fact, it's a landscape where women and children and grandmothers live and do the kinds of things that women and children and grandmothers do all around the world, in spite of the horrors of the wall. And you know, for, for 40 minutes, we were able to show that the actions that take place on one side have a consequence on the other side. And, and there was a quote from El Pais, the Spanish language, uh, the, the, the newspaper from Spain, uh, who, who said, uh, they, they quoted Archimedes. Uh, they said, give me a fulcrum long enough and a place on which to rest it and I can move the world. And I thought that was a really beautiful way to describe this project. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, I think we all should join in on a virtual collective clapping of hands. Bravo, bravo. Uh, we are pretty we're pretty close to running out of time. So I want to pass the mic to the audience uh, to see if anybody has some pressing questions that they'd like to share. Uh, so please um, come forward. I didn't mean to go so much over. I didn't realize. Uh, but thanks for your patience with this. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Luis Arturo Gomez Escobedo. Um, and I'm a third year architecture student here at CCA. Um, I don't think I have any question and I just wanted to say how grateful I am and it was just such a powerful um, presentation. And um, I'm actually an undocumented student here at CCA and I've lived in San Francisco for 14 years. And I remember seeing this all over the media um, and just how powerful that work was. Um, and just, I just feel really grateful to witness this presentation here. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for speaking and, and for example, giving a voice to somebody like me, um, who it's, it's just kind of like, uh, there's a famous song like, um, by Los Tigres del Norte. And it says, it's a golden cage. Um, it's a golden cage that we live in, um, as undocumented. Um, in the undocumented community. And this just means a lot. And I just wanted to say how grateful I am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luis. It means a lot to me, what you're saying. I appreciate it. Ron, I have a question for you. Um, great to hear this lecture. Thank you so much. We're certainly living in an unprecedented time. Um, and your proposals offer a counter argument, I think. And in that, I think my question is, is it important for an architect to also be an activist? Um, that's a great question. Thanks. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, for, for years, I taught a course at Berkeley called uh, Design and Activism. And it was a course that I meant to call Design is Activism. And uh, while I don't think that it's important for a designer to call him or herself an activist, I think that it's important to recognize that what designers do 
is literally change the world. And when they recognize that they have that power, that they can change the world, I think they should put that power to good use. Um, the part of that class showed that um, what an activist does and what an architect does what it is very similar. Right? They often work uh, through legal structures. They often work with uh, different constituencies. They, they represent certain people in their work as service providers. The, I, I point out in that class that the one thing that architects don't do that activists do is have the willingness to be arrested for their beliefs. Um, and that's the one distinction. And so I, I point that out to the students because um, it makes me wonder about uh, how far we can push design for the public good during times that, as you say, are unprecedented. Thanks for that question. Thank you, Ron. We have time for one more question. There's a question in the chat, Jose. Um, okay, let's see. Um, thank you for such an amazing presentation and for your incredible work. Do you see any artists or architects who are in conversation with you working in other border spaces like Haiti and the Dominican Republic? Mm. Uh, I don't know of anyone working in those contexts. There, there are plenty of artists and architects and designers that I'm in conversation with uh, along this border, um, many of which are in, and many of whom are in San Francisco, Ana Teresa Fernandez, Richard Misrag, Guillermo Galindo, uh, Post Commodity, uh, Tanya Aguinaga, who's in Los Angeles, uh, R, who's in Tijuana. Um, so th there are some pretty amazing heroes that I have in this space and many of them who have given me the courage to do some of this work, to be honest. Um, and, and certainly I do know of, of uh, designers and artists and architects working in other spaces, the Haiti and the Dominican Republic. I actually don't, I actually don't know, but that's a really interesting uh, thought. Uh, I'd be interested to know if there are, uh, who they are and they should be, um, I think their story should be told. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today and for helping us end uh, this amazing uh, virtual series of events for Make Act Resist. Uh, it's, it's been a long time coming and we're really happy that you were able to join us for this. Uh, everyone, we welcome you to please continue to look at the website for makeactresist.cca.edu where we continue to have more asynchronous content for the rest of October. And, uh, Yes, I think this has been an amazing conversation on being able to allow us to re-examine uh, our roles of art as artists and designers and to really question our agency within this really important uh, series of topics um, with tremendous urgency. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Jose. Adios, thank you. hasta la vista. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.